Hello and welcome to another edition of Cars Etc Etc, a show about cars etc etc. Brought to you by altcointrader.co.za. Go there, register for free and then you can start your world of cryptocurrency. When it comes to the world of cars, style and design, there is no one that can match themselves to the mark of Alfa Romeo. For the past 110 years, this company has made some of the most beautiful cars ever to grace the streets of the world. But they've also made some very finicky and erratic cars as well. They all have their own personality. Alfa Romeo have built trucks. They have built or um, engines for um, uh, boats. They built engines for aircraft. You name it, they have done everything. In the hot seat is Trevor Tuck. A man, I think, who knows more about Alfa Romeo than Alfa Romeo knows about themselves. <laughs> hey, is that fair to say, Trev? No, no. <laughs> <laughs> but you do know a lot. Where you grew up with uh, as Alfa. Yeah. Uh, firstly, thanks for having me. Pleasure. Um, yeah, I mean, uh, I started with Alfa Romeo at the age of 18. I got my first Alfa Giulia. So it's been... This year celebrates 30 years of being involved with Alfa Romeo for me and the love affair for Alfa Romeo for me. What, when you were 18 and, and you were going to get a car, what made you decide to buy an Alfa as opposed to a VW or a Toyota or a, anything else? Well, it, it was a complete accident actually because I, I needed a car for, uh, to go to college and back in Musenberg. I lived in the southern suburbs and um, my dad sort of said, no, we'll find a little Beetle or a Mini or, you know, the normal student cars that one had in the, in the early 90s. And uh, I just saw a picture of this Julia and I just couldn't believe that a car like this existed, that, uh, you know, <laughs> something that ugly could be that beautiful. And uh, I said to my dad, no, that's the car that I want. So I said, well, if you want that, you buy it with your own money, which I did. And uh, when I saw my first one, I just couldn't believe the the technical excellence of the engineering and the, and, and the way that they did things. And I, that was my first car and I've, and I've never not had one. I've only ever had them. I know, it's just, it's actually fascinating watching you uh, over the years. Alfa Romeo has an incredible history in South Africa. Um, at one stage, Trevor, I mean, besides Italy, this was the only country in the world that yeah. made Alfa Romeos. Yeah. I mean, there must be tons of them around here. Well, I mean, that's the thing about South Africa. We were the only country outside of Italy that built Alfa Romeos. We had a factory. Um, so, and we built and sold a lot of Alfa Romeos in the 60s, 70s, 80s, before they pulled out in 85. Uh, Alfa Romeo in South Africa, it was, I, I, I think it was, at one stage, it was their second biggest market. So, I mean, the, the history of Alfa Romeo in South Africa is mega, it's huge. So what went wrong? Why, why did Alfa Romeo pull out? Why, why did all of a sudden it get this unbelievably horrible stigma attached to it in South Africa? Oh, well, I mean, they, they, they pulled out with, with uh, you know, with the exodus for apartheid and things like that. So it was political um, sort of exodus. Um, they decided to leave. Some people said they went bankrupt. <laughs> uh, who, who knows? <laughs> uh, but, you know, they, they, they left for political reasons, which was sad because we lost out on a whole generation of wonderful alphas after 85 when they left. But, you know, the, the flip side and the good side of that is that we were left with all these beautiful cars yes. that we had the most of uh, as a right-hand right route market. Uh, the 70s, the 60s, the 80s alphas. So, so we were lucky in that, that respect. Yeah, very, very much so as well. Why is it that Alfa Romeo classic cars, in talking of that, that era, 50s, 60s, 70s, and even into the 80s, why do they achieve such astronomical prices? If there are so many of them. Well, this, is, this has been a recent thing. So this has been the last sort of 15 years or so, where the market for classic Alfa Romeo has gone through the roof. They've become, they've become an international commodity, an asset, yeah. uh, the world over. So they, they've, they've literally gone stratospheric in their, in their prices. For the, what we like to call the 105 series cars, the Juniors, the Julias, the Spiders, the Bellinas, those sort of Alfa Romeos. Um, and it's as a result of, I've always 
said that uh, the technology that Alframar had in those years of those cars yes. was so far ahead of its time that they only really got understood much later on in life. Correct. And then people realized, hey, but these are fantastic cars. In the 2000s and 2005, you, you know, 2005, 2006, when the boom really started with them, they thought, well, you could drive this thing, you could drive a Spider every day, you could drive a Junior every day. Mm. And then you had companies like Alphaholics that came along and they, you know, they glamorized these cars and they started to you, you know, make them into uh, uh, rat rods or, or uh, resto mods, as they like to call them. Okay, yes. And, and, and they started, to, you, you know, to, to, um, you know, to, to, to pick up the, the, the memento of the, of the actual market of these cars. Uh, and you've got those sort of companies. You've got, in America, you've got uh, Paul Spool Racing. You've got, and it, it, it was the competition, the racing, the, the sportiness of, of, of Alpha's you know, true heritage that started. And also how beautiful they are. Yeah, well, I mean, that's the thing, you know, they, uh, <laughs> I mean, my friends always said, you know, well, you know, alphas are so finicky and they, this and that. And but they aren't actually, Trevor, are they that finicky? I mean, you know me, I've got two left hands and I've also owned alphas all, all my life and I've managed, I mean, they're not that finicky or we just, I don't know, expectations, or is it just a bum rap that people say, oh, it's got an oil leak, you've got an alpha, it's got an oil leak, yeah. stuck on the side of the road. I mean, it's not really that factual. No, so I always have this conversation, and I, and I try and steer clear of it, because it, it can get a bit heated. <laughs> <laughs> and whenever you meet somebody, and they say, oh, what do you do? And you're just like, you know, I have a few alphas, and they go, oh, alpha god, don't you have to warm that thing up in the morning? And, yes. all this sort of, uh, and you sort of, you know, I... The, the best explanation that I can give is that in the 70s and the 60s when these cars were made, they were more like a Swiss watch. You know, they were like an automatic Swiss watch and they had intricate little pieces and they were, they were just beautifully machined and engineered. And then you had the Japanese cars that were more like a Casio watch that was, you know, had a battery and it lasted forever until it was finished and you threw it away. And so that sort of, uh, the, the the temperament of the of the Alfa Romeos is, is the stigma involved in that is just because people think, well, they're just too complicated. They've got twin choke Weber carbs and they've got twin cams and the engine's aluminium and the gearbox is aluminium. And they've had all those things in the sixties and seventies and it, you know, later on cars started having those things. Yeah. So So they were over engineered. They were far ahead of their time. And that was the beauty of them. They were just so far ahead of their time. Okay. So, I mean, you've mentioned the, the, the 105 series, but we'll get, get to that um, uh, in a short while. Let, let's start off with the Giulietta from the 1950s. Uh, I mean, how many derivatives were there? Because, I mean, I remember the Giulietta Sprint Veloci, mm. but how many were there? There were quite a few. Uh, so, 101 series car <laughs> was sort of Alpha's first mass-produced car. Um, okay. And the Giulietta base, uh, 101 series car had quite a few derivatives. So they had the coupe, uh, which was a Giulietta Sprint, and you got that in 1300, 1600. You got uh, the Spider, Giulietta Spider, yes. also 1300, 1600. And um, then you sort of had the box one. Then you got the TR, which was that only was 1300. One. It's quite complicated. The 1600 Giulietta is actually called a Giulia. So you've, you've got to watch your sort of uh, jargon with, and your terminology because if you were next to an Alfisti, they would say, but that's incorrect. A 1600 is called a Giulia, but it was the 101 series. And then you've got cars like the Sprint Speciale that was... Uh, yeah. Which know, is one of the most beautiful cars in the world. Yeah, I mean, it was, uh, at the time, it was the most aerodynamic uh, car they ever produced. And I mean, the 1300cc. Uh, capable of you know 124 miles an hour, 200 kilometers an hour, and that was sort of you know late 50s. So I've seen a few of those in in South Africa. Yeah, we had a few. The, the, there are mm. a few. Uh, if they come up on market, Trev, what what sort of prices would they be looking at? And let's forget about the export market because we'll talk to talk about that in, in a short. No, while. I mean uh, one was sold recently for two million rand. So that's, two million rand. Yeah, yeah, that's where that, that's where they are. So. Um, are parts still available, readily available for these classic cars, 50s, 60s, 70s? I think there are more parts available now for old Alfa Romeos than there ever were. 
<laughs> so you have these companies in the UK, uh, I've mentioned before, Alpha Holix, yeah. Classic Alpha. In Germany, you've got uh, uh, GT, Formula GT, and you've got uh, Bertelsbeck, and you've got all of these companies that are now remanufacturing parts for the 105 oh, really? series car. You can pretty much buy a 105 series car and rebuild it um, from, with, scratch. from scratch. Um, Nuts and bolts. Yeah. Uh, there's even a full carbon fiber one now, so you don't even need the body. They can build the car from nothing. Is anybody making the engines? So that is a problem. Uh -huh. uh, the engines are a big issue because, as you know, it's an aluminium engine, a wet liner aluminium engine. So, um, and, and that specific type of aluminium doesn't conform to modern day uh, emission and, uh, oh, and so you've got to the, find an old engine. Are, yeah, so you've got to, you've you still got to get an old, but, but <coughs> again, luckily, there's still so many around uh, because they sold thousands of those cars back in the day. Even in South Africa, they sold thousands and thousands of them. So you can always find, you know, engines around and things. And obviously, the trend with the resto mod car is using a later engine from an Alpha 75 twin spark engine, and then they would put that in the earlier cars. So okay. that's also, you know, the thing to do. Now, let, let's just stick on that resto mod because, I mean, you um, famously won the hill climb a couple of years ago, Samola hill climb, in a junior, and bear with me, okay, because this will also gets very confusing, in a junior looking car but you had a twin spark engine. Yep. So that's the retro yep. mod that you're talking about. So that car um, was built to try and keep within the spirit of GTAM, GTA um, which of course stands for GT America. Um, those cars raced in 1970, 1971 uh, in the World Touring Car Championships, and they used narrow angle twin spark engines which if you could find one today is probably about one and a half million rand just for the engine just the engine yeah if you could find one wow. so the later alpha 75 and 155 use a very similar design but they're obviously a bit later so i built my car uh, in the spirit of gtam uh, using that narrow angle engine on fuel injection and 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 so um, i was always under the impression that the gtam and we're talking about now the junior which is a Julia. Yeah, it's actually not called a Junior. <laughs> yes, it's a Julia. It's a GTV. It's but a GTV, the GTA M. I was under the impression that it was just a 1300. No, no, no. So, so it had the special engine. No, so 105 cars, uh, when you talk about Junior, you talk 1300. So yes. a GT Junior is a 1300 car. Okay, but now let's just talk GTA M because we'll go to the 105 series. GTA M, you got in GT1300 Junior, which was also a wide body car. Yes, fully aluminium. No, uh, y yes, well, well, aluminium, but in, 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 group, in group five spec had the big uh, wide fenders and everything, so it looked like a GT AM. Remember, the AM came sort of almost uh, six, seven years after the step nose cars, as we like to call them. Okay. So two completely different uh, shaped cars. Yeah. But the GT AM was a fuel injected narrow angle twin spark beast of a car that this is the engine that is so rare to find yeah that's the engine that's so rare to find and that car raced against cars like bmw 3 liter csl um ford capri 3 liter uh you know, all of that stuff all of that stuff back in the day and it <laughs> usually gave them a blood nose um, but just on a point, I did win the hill climb in the Julia as well. So yes, <laughs> Julia Caesar. Yes, Julia. And then again later in a GT Junior. So okay. Now this is where it gets confusing. Trevor has mentioned the Alfa Romeo 105 series a lot, and it's very very popular. Trevor, please explain. We get a car that looks, which I grew up knowing as a GT Junior, okay, but it's not a GT Junior. It can be a GT Junior, but it can be a GTV and it can be a Julia. Yeah. Can you just tell us what is what? So the next time I see somebody and say, oh, you got a nice Junior, I don't get slapped across the head. Yeah. Okay. So very basically and quickly, the, the first 105 series car was a Julia. That okay. was a Julia TI. That's the boxy four-door saloon, the one that I love so much. Yes, that was your the, first car. That my first car, and I still have a Julia. 
Um, so that, that was the first 105 series car. That was a Julia uh, TI. That came in d different derivatives. You got Super, you got uh, TI, uh, you got Rally, which was a South African special. Then you've got the Coupe, um, which people refer to as the Bertone. Yes. It's a Bertone design car. Uh, and you've got Stepnose version, which has got you know, the two lights on the outside and the little uh, step Dented in the front, the, uh, front of the bonnet. Yeah. And then you get the later uh, smooth nose car, or in Italian, the Unificato car, which is uh, four lights in front, could also have two lights in front, four or two, and then the smooth bonnet. Okay. Uh, so the first, w the first of the coupes was the Giulia Sprint GT, which is a 1600 car. Okay. After that, you got Giulia Sprint GTV, and the V is for Veloce. So that's the up-spec, that's the hotter cams, the better carbs, uh, the faster version. So V is always... Veloce. Veloce. It's the quickest one. So you had Giulia Sprint GT, Giulia Sprint GTV. Um, after that, they launched the GT Juniors, which was 1300. Juniors, Only 1300. Yeah, Juniors always 1300. So when you say, oh, that's a Junior, uh, if it's a two-litre GTV, it's not a junior. It's not a. It's a GTV Julia. Yeah, correct. So, I'm learning. So the the juniors were thirteen hundred, and you got thirteen hundred GT Junior. Then you got sixteen hundred GT. GT. In the same. Yeah. There we go. And then, and then, and then you got seventeen fifty GTV. Seventeen fifty only came in GTV. Okay. Then you got two-litre GTV. GTV. Also in Veloci. Okay. So it's. Uh, Alfa Romeo had four engines over the over the uh, the 105 series cars. Basically, had four engine yeah. derivatives: the 1300, 16, the 1600, 1750, 1750, and two liter. Trevor, the one thing that I found, and, and I'm sure this must affect uh, resale um, prices um, uh, as well as desirability, is m a lot of the cars, whether they're Alfa Spiders, GTVs. I'm talking of Julia GTV, GT, Junior. The, so many people have taken these cars and, and changed engines. So chassis and engine numbers are not the same. Why has this happened so much? And is it fair to say that it's quite rare to find an engine and chassis car the same? Yeah, I mean, people always talk about matching number cars. Oh, I've got a matching yes. number car. What does that mean? Uh, well, the chassis number and the engine number uh, are of the same period or they match. It's actually not the case with Alfa Romeo because okay. the, the, you, you could have a range of engines that fit in that chassis range. So Alfa Romeo's bookkeeping were never really very good in the <laughs> 70s. And they didn't really know, you know which car went ah, with which engine. Okay. But, but there, there are, so you could, ha you could have a Bellina engine that is also okay to fit into a 1750 Spider. It's of the same series. So the matching number argument never really um, so it doesn't washes. Really, okay, so it doesn't uh, really matter. Really, for the purists, they, they love it. You know, the fact that it's, the car's got its original engine, you know, from, uh, from 1973 or whatever. But that's only if you can find the, the yeah. bookkeeping. But the, the beauty about Alfa Romeo and the beauty about 105 series cars is that they were basically built by Lego uh, in the same way that Lego is built. You, you, can, you can swap the engines, swap the gearboxes, swap the differentials. It's all interchangeable. There's, al there's almost no difference. So a, a 1962 Julia 1600 engine looks exactly the same is what it did when they finished production in 1994 in the, in the last series four spiders. I mean, the basic design is exactly the same. And this is why you get these sort of cross, you know, the engine changes okay. and the gearbox changes and the diff change, because it's just so easy to do and practical, you know. It makes a lot of sense, but it, it, uh, and, and so what you're saying is it doesn't really, I mean, unless you find one from the bookkeeping somewhere along the line and say, oh, matching numbers, matching, etc. Unless you've got a car that was a, let's say, a 1300 Junior, and now you put a 2-litre GTV engine yeah. in, you will notice because of the shape of the car? Yeah. So, let me just clarify. The engine numbers themselves are from a particular type of car. So you might have a 536 engine number and you know, well, that's a Veloci engine. Okay. Uh, so you, you, you know, when they talk about matching 
matching numbers car. I hear if I've got saying. a GTV uh, as long and, as it's I, a 536, and I've got the 536 Veloci engine, you know, happy days. Okay. But were I to have a 512 later two liter engine, you know, the Alpha Anoraks are going to go, oh, no, that's not. Okay. That, that, well, that, clar no, that cl clarifies that. Not, um, I actually uh, found, just on a note, <coughs> I found an engine belonging to a TZ. Um, oh, wow. Yeah, in this country. So. And you found it? Yeah, my friend Patrick Gearing and myself found it. Yeah. Where did you find it? No, I don't know. We'll move on to the <laughs> next question. <laughs> okay. What alphas should one buy and what should one not in terms of 50s, 60s, 70s, 80s? Look, somebody, somebody wants to get into the market and we know that the, the car's prices are very, very expensive. Yeah. But what sh what's hot and what's not? At the moment, uh, the Bertones, um, GT Junior, GTV, 1750, those cars, there doesn't seem to be enough of them. The demand is exceeding supply mm. um, by the, an astronomical figure. There's, people are actually fighting over those cars now to try and get their hands on a Junior or a GTV coupe. The, th that's the hottest uh, market at the moment. Okay. Uh, slightly behind that is the Julia saloons, the box saloons. Yeah. They've sort of plateaued a little bit. Um, okay. But they, they were always the Minos, and then they went through a huge jump, and they've sort of plateaued a little bit, but they're still a hot property. Bellinas, if you wanted to start now, one would start with a Bellina, which is the later, bigger car. It's not as pretty. Uh, it's, it's not as funky as a Julia or a, or a Bertone, um, but it, it, it does provide a good way into the market for yeah. relatively... And it's the same mm, engine. It's exactly the same car. Uh, it actually drives better because it's a long wheelbase car. It's a later technology. Uh, it, they're great cars, but they just they don't seem to have the market appeal as the Julia and the Junior. And then spiders, of course. You can never go wrong with a soft top. So um, spiders are, are hot if you can find them. Unfortunately, most spiders in South Africa are left-hand drive. So yes. it, it puts a lot of people off. We, only, uh, we, we had right-hand drive spider, I think, up until 1978 or 79, somewhere around there. Um, but a lot of people are sort of a bit hesitant about the left-hand drive cars. Okay. Um, and, but that's in the 105 range. Um, <coughs> okay, so that's what's to look at. In terms of spider, there's always the talk, I mean, the movie The Graduate, of course, there was Dustin Hoffman, there was the Alpha Spider, it's an iconic car. You get the, the square box shape, and of course you get the round shape back. Mm. That seems to be much more popular. Yeah, so that's uh, the round tail, or what people like to refer to as the boat tail spiders. Those are the most, uh, the most sought after and the okay. most valuable. A, a, a nice boat tail, round tail now is upwards of 500,000, between five Is that and called seven. a duetto? That's that in 1600 form, that's called a duetto. Aha, only 1600 yeah. form. Yeah. So then 1750 and two litre. Yeah. Did Spider ever come as a 1300? Yes, it did. As well? Yeah. Okay, and that's called also 105? Yeah, called a junior. A junior Spider? Yeah. What is wrong with these Italians? <laughs> 1300 is a junior. So, okay, well now we know that. So, so you've got a boat tail spider and a junior, 1300 as well. Three. So 1300, 1600, 1750 in boat tail. Then after that was the square back, what you call cam tail. Yeah. That's the chopped off back. That came 1750 and two litre. Yeah. And then after that we had the aerodynamica. The one with yes. the big rubber bumpers and the spoilers. and Made specifically, I think, more for America. Yeah. Well... I'm, I'm not sure if it was made for America, but you did get American versions that mm -hmm. were slightly longer, but it was the sort of the hot version um, of that car. They, they are actually the best driving 105 series cars, the, the, the Spider Aerodynamics. They, they, they're the quickest, so they make the most power. They, they really are fantastic cars to drive. And then after that, you got the Spider Series 4, which was a much softer looking car, toned down, uh, fuel injected, air conditioning, power steering, electric windows, a much softer sort of. The trip, talking of these engines, the 105 engine series or whatever, people refer to as the Busso engine. Then you've got something like Alpha Sud, okay, which all of a sudden people are beginning to say, oh, I'm trying to find an Alpha Sud. But that's an engine, I mean, that's sort of car that I would sit there and say, if you don't know much about stuff, rather stay away. Yeah. Is, is it fair comment? Suds have seen a huge increase in the last uh, two or three years in yeah. market venues. They've now become the hottest things on the planet. People are buying Suns all over the Remember, the Alpha Sud was designed by Rushka. Was, he was an engineer with Porsche. 
So that's why it has a flat four engine, the same as the Porsche or a, okay. in the back in the day, because the engineer came across from that. So they were famed for their handling, for their road holding, and their engine, which was just a masterpiece. Um, and lately, they've seen an incredible resurgence in value and in, terms, in their popularity. Their big drawback was is that because they were built in Naples, um, yeah. in, the, in the south of Italy, as a sort of project by the government to get workers to uh, back to work and the economy going, they were built by people who didn't really know how to build cars. So it's very often you find as you know the driver's door and the passenger door swapped around. I'm joking, <laughs> but. <laughs> <laughs> but that has been the problem with Sudden. It's plagued Sudden its whole life. You know, they weren't quite, uh, yeah. some people say they weren't even they were asymmetrical. I don't think they were galvanized either. I mean, I no, think so the story about the steel was that, you know, there were stories that it was cheap steel from the Soviets. It's all, it's rubbish. They were, they were transported across different factories and sometimes left outside while they were busy building stuff. So the, they, was, they were left outside in the rain and the snow and the, during the build process. Um, just because the factory wasn't geared to, to do that, they, they, they had no idea. I mean, that's so sad. But I mean, so if you could find yourself in Alpha Sud, I mean, it's it's not a bad project to work on. No, Suds are great. If you can find them, they're really great little engines. They're bomb-proof engines and they, they're great little cars. You, you will suffer with the rust, um, but there are some very nice ones around. There's some in Europe now that are selling for over 500,000 Rand for a nice Sud. Oh, that's mad. Okay, speaking of the export market, um, Trevor, if, if you go into um, UK websites and you look up, you know, an Alpha Julia or a GT Junior or something, there are tons and tons of them. Yet, people want ones from South Africa. Yeah. Amazing. Is it because they, when they were built here, they were just built so much better? Or what is, why is there that demand? And why are we seeing so many Alpha Romeos also, unfortunately, leaving our shores? <laughs> So it's a, it's a two-pronged approach, uh, and it, it's very sad that we're yeah. losing alphas. Um, I know a specific company that exports up to 30 alphas a month from South Africa, uh, and they've been doing that for a while. And it's not just them, there's a whole lot of um, you know, wow. people exporting. And these are refurbed? No, uh, sometimes no. just a project. Uh, because of the value of our currency, uh, the prices that we charge or ask for cars here is a mere smidgen of what mm. they cost in Europe or the UK. So it it's makes sense for somebody from the UK to buy a car from South Africa. The shipping to ship it to the UK is 40,000 bucks and uh, off it goes. So they can get and a right hand drive car, it's 2,000 pounds. And a while ago, you know, you, you could buy a car here for almost half of what it would cost you to get in the UK. That's fair. The other huge factor is rust. Uh, because the factory was in Brits, and because a lot of Alphas spend most of their time on the high felt, they didn't rust like they do in Europe. So when they buy a car from South Africa, they're usually rust-free examples. And it provides then a good base to be able to restore the car from. So that is why the South African market is, is the market to look at for, for these specifically 105 series, 116 cars as well. We haven't even spoken about those GTV yeah. 6, GTV 3 litre. I mean, uh, huge international commodities at the moment and commanding huge prices. Okay, before we get into the GTVs and, and that, Trev, so somebody sits and finds a Berliner, okay and says, well, you know, it's a project, I'd like, to, I'd like to get into Alfa Romeo, it sounds like they're quite fun to work on. Put it up on a lift. What, what, what's the first thing you look for and the one thing that would make you walk away? For me, it's accident damage. Um, okay. You've got to remember, while the technology in those old cars was 50 years ahead of most other cars, they were also 50 years ahead of most drivers at that time. So ah. a lot of them were, were crashed. They were just too fast for the 60s and the 70s. You, you can imagine, most of those cars were 200 km an hour cars, you know, uh, let's, let's say 170 km an hour. Doing that in the 60s and 70s, you, I mean, it's, <laughs> crazy. It, it's crazy. And they had no safety, uh, you know, sort of features. Things. I mean, the Julia things. was the first car in South Africa to have seat belts fitted from, from brand new. So the first thing that I look at as a, as a collector, as a builder, as a racer, is the chassis. Okay. Is it straight? Is it skew? You, you know, 
if it's straight and it's not too, everything else from there is easy. You know, the engine can be rebuilt, the gearbox can be rebuilt, and there's parts for it. So rust you can cut out. Yeah, rust, and you can buy panels for them and things okay. like that. So for me, the the number one thing is the fact that the car is straight, the chassis is straight, because uh, if it's not, you're going to sit with a dog of a car for the rest of your yeah, life and things like work. that. But that's what I would check. So Trevor, how these cars are very expensive. I and mean, you mentioned some crazy names, uh, 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 Giulietta Sprint Speciale. Uh, now you sit and say two million rand. I sit and go, geez, I would love that car. But it's 1957. Um, I haven't got two million rand. But it, is there a way to finance classic Alfa Romeo cars? Yeah, I, I think there is. Um, because they've become you know, the assets now, the people see yes. them as commodities and assets and, they're, they're, and they're high value items. So, yeah, I think you can. You can insure them. Um, my historic alphas are insured. Um, so, I, I mean, I wouldn't finance one as your daily driver. No, but, no, no. But, <laughs> but I mean, but, but I mean, yes. Uh, because of its asset value and it's more than likely its big appreciation. Uh, yeah. It should yeah. Well, they're only going to go up. They're not going to go down. So. Yeah. Trevor, perhaps in my humble opinion, the most beautiful car ever made is the Alfa Romeo 33 Stradale. Mm -hmm. Very few of them uh, uh, around. Why was this car made and what, besides its looks, what's so special about it besides its rarity? Well, I mean, in 1967 when they, when they made those cars, you can just imagine what it looked like in 1967 when it came out. It, I think to this day it's probably still remains one of the most beautiful cars in the world. Yeah, without a doubt. And what they did is basically take a 2 litre V8 out of their race cars and build a car for the road. That's why it's called a Stradale, which is a road, as you know, yeah. or street. And they only built 18 examples of them. So they were incredibly expensive in the day. I mean, only the rich and famous had them. Uh, but it was basically a race car for the road, dressed in this gorgeous, you know, uh, body. So and very lightweight, I mean. Yeah, I mean, the f lightweight sort of aluminum chassis, the fuel tank sat right next to you. I think it was even magnesium. And um, the fuel tank, so it was, it was basically a I petrol mean. bomb on wheels. Um, <laughs> But <laughs> and now you're going to pay 20 million pounds for it. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I mean, that's the thing. You know, you got, money can't buy that car. You, you haven't seen one for sale for forever because there, there only were 18 of them. Oh, I've actually yeah. seen some of the derivatives in Italy at the museum. And to look at they're just, they're mesmerizing. And to think that they could make a car like that. At that time as well. At that time. It's just unbelievable. Whew. Trevor Racing. I mean, Alfa Romeo's history of oh. racing is, is unbelievable. Let's talk about it, uh, specifically South Africa, 70s and 80s, Arnold Chats with the Alfa Romeo's. Um, and then, of course, um, our very own South African developed and designed uh, GTV6 3 litre. Yeah. I mean, an astonishing vehicle. I, mem I remember going watching racing at Kyle Army up against the, the huge BMWs and, mm. and everything else. Um, quite a unique uh, vehicle that, that was made and also also limited. Yeah, uh, GDV6 was uh, specifically brought out for Group 1 racing. It was uh, the brainchild of the Alpha Marketing Department. Uh, Roger McCleary was involved, uh, Dr. Bianco was involved, uh, um, David de Villiers was involved, some people, Bosman was the brains behind the whole thing. Yeah. Um, the, made 212 of them, give or take 500, nobody knows. <laughs> <laughs> Again, <laughs> the, the record keeping is... <laughs> 212, give or take 1,000. Yeah, yeah, the record keeping is not very good on them. But uh, a specific homologated car, yes. South African special, built specifically to go racing. And they had to build a certain amount in order to race in the then Group 1 championships, wouldn't which they you know, which they did very well in. But uh, that car today is our holy grail, you know. I, mean, I saw one on auction the other day, I think sold for 1.2 million rand. Yeah, yeah. Uh, and I mean, it was in good nick, but it wasn't concourse. Yeah, there, 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 there are one or two others out there that I, know, that I know of, that I've seen with my own eyes, that have got less than 30,000 Ks in them. And really? those cars will be uh, not less than 2 million rand, you know, and, and are they sought after? 
used uh, by international people as well? They are. Uh, a lot of them are, uh, have been exported okay. because they are South African specials. And I believe they've also tried to get them homologated for Group 2 racing in, in, in Europe uh, because they can only race 2.5s. So oh, yes, okay. the 3 litres are... Uh, you know, the homologation process for that in Europe is quite difficult to do because those cars were never really raced internationally. Yeah, yeah, yeah. They were South African special. But an incredibly important car in Alfa Romeo's history. Um, but, you know... The very rare. They are. They're, they're very, very rare They're very cars. rare. Other racing in... in uh, I mean, you know, uh, uh, Alfa Romeo had a, had a brilliant time in, in uh, DTM racing. We're talking Europe 155. I mean, you know, those yeah. are just, I mean, you get one of those races. The blood cars. nose car. Yeah. It I mean, gave it everyone will, a blood nose. Everyone, <laughs> it's just magnificent. But back in South Africa, and I remember you were very, very much part of it, the 147 GTAs. Yeah. These were purpose built international touring cars that were brought into South Africa. I mean, those were just magnificent. Um, and, and you've yeah. got to hope that Alfa Romeo goes that way again when they go racing, besides Formula One. Yeah, I mean, that was an incredible time. And as you mm. said, I was involved in that time. Um, yeah. And uh, those cars were bought by, by Alfa Romeo South Africa. Um, and they were bought from in technology in Italy, left-hand drive touring cars. And uh, they, were, they, they were called 147 Cup cars. So they were basically touring cars. Um, our delegates flew over there and they said, please take the engine out. And the Italian said, why do you want to take the engine out? And they said, no, we want to put a V6 Busso in it. And they said, you're crazy, you know, it'll never work. <laughs> so they agreed and they took the engines out, the two litre 16 valve engines with the sequential gearboxes and, and the cars came across here and they were then fitted with, with the 3.2 Busso engines. As from the GTA? From the GTA. Oh, okay. And uh, again, they went racing and they were incredibly successful. And I, and I think the last great period in South African motorsport with BMW, Alfa Romeo, uh, I mean, it, it was a real clash. You had Martin Steyn, Anthony Taylor. Uh, it was wonderful. Uh, it was absolutely magnificent times. So, and those three cars are still here and they still survive and they're still part of a collection. So they, you know, we still have those three cars in this country, three of them. Which is wonderful, wonderful. Now you spoke about the GTV6, um, the Julia you mentioned earlier, the Julia Rally. Yeah. Also a South African uh, innovation, yeah. um, I assume for rallying. No, uh, it was a marketing ploy because they couldn't sell any more GTVs. So they, <laughs> they, they, had, a, they had a surplus of GTVs. Uh, that's the story that I heard the story uh, unconfirmed from somebody who was actually on the production line of that. And they, uh, all they did is they took a two litre GTV and they took the running gear out of that. Uh, and they put it in a 1600 Julia Super and they took the 1600 Julia Super running out, gear out and they put it in the GTV and they called the GTV a Deluxe, 1600 Deluxe. So it, had, <laughs> <laughs> it was basically a 2 litre GTV with 1600 running gear and mechanicals and then the rally became a 2 litre rally. Okay. Were, the story goes there were 40 of them built. Um, they were never marketed officially by Alfa Romeo. Uh, to find, you can't find them in the price list uh, anywhere. anywhere. But an incredibly sought after car all over the world. Most of our rallies have been exported. And I've actually spent some time with, the, um, with, with somebody from the Alfa Romeo uh, archives in Italy to try and have this car. Alfa Romeo think that the rally is so important, for, again, for international racing. Yes international historic racing, if they can prove that it was homologated and that uh, it was built by Alfa Romeo themselves, they can have it homologated for racing. And go for historical Unfortunately, racing. Unfortunately, there was no homologation papers because somebody just said, uh, swap, the, swap the engine. So, <laughs> but what, an incredibly rare car. What brilliant bookkeeping. Trev, listen, we could talk, talk forever. Um, uh, let's just go through a couple. Huge models from the the, the 1980s um, up up until even you know the 2000s or whatever. The Alfa Romeo 155. We eventually got them in South Africa. They yeah. weren't you know we, we had that uh, hiatus where Alfa Romeo was wasn't here. Uh, the various different Spider versions and then two very very special cars, the Alfa Romeo 8C 
which never came here, unfortunately, no. and the Alfa Romeo 4C. Mm. So we're talking about the modern cars, and we'll talk about Julia and, and mm. Stelvio in a, in, a, in a short while. Are these all collectibles, all the 155s, or are there specific 155s that are collectibles? Yeah, 155s, again, seen a resurgent later. Uh, uh, it's been dragged along by the Alfa Romeo market. The Alfa Romeo market in general has just gone up, the classic Alfa Romeo market. Yes. So 155s are being dragged along and of course as you know we get older we appreciate the older cars but the younger generation appreciate different ones. So for them watching the 155 DTM car give the Mercedes Benz a blood nose and the BMW E30s, they love that. So they love 155s yeah. or to watch the British Touring Car Championship in 94 where they, where they creamed everyone. You know the kids love that. So those cars are finding form. They, you, cars like the 8C are just, you know, it's probably, it's just, yeah. uh, you know, we're lucky if we ever see one. You know, there were so many. But the 4C is a funny one because the 4C uh, is the last sort of real sports car that they built on on a, what I like to call the, an old techno technology platform where it was basic, you know. None, no, none of the fancy push buttons in it. It's a basic driver's Alfa Romeo. Two door, no roof or a roof and you know turbo yeah, charge 1750 flat out off you go okay. and uh and again the the values of those cars in the last 24 months have gone through the I roof know. it's I mean, amazing but three years ago you couldn't couldn't sell them I, I bought my one on special when they couldn't sell them and, and I, now all of a sudden you I, can't I, find it the dealer phoned me back and offered me double for the car it's like, have you lost your mind <laughs> But, but again, those are cars, uh, future classics, absolute future classics. Future classics, definitely future classics. Wrapping up, where we are now with Alfa Romeo in terms of the new cars, Julia, Julia QV, GTA M, Stelvio, Tonale coming, coming now. Why is there still this reluctance and um, cautiousness in specifically the South African market to go out and buy these unbelievably brilliant cars. There is nothing wrong, if anything, that can compete with any of their German, German counterparts. Why are people still reluctant? I think a lot of us down to dealer network. Um, not enough dealers. There's just not enough dealers. There's not enough support. People are still wary of them. They look at them. They like them. They love them. But they still think, you know, it's an Alfa Romeo. It still has, you know, the 60s, 70s, 80s stigma attached to them. Mm. And there's just a lack of support for them. But they're incredible cars. The new QV is a beautiful thing. I mean, it scares... I've never been that scared in a car as what I was in a QV driving. <laughs> and that I, doesn't have any buttons either. Yeah, yeah. I mean, they're just <laughs> incredible cars. And uh, Stelvio as well, Tonale coming. Um, you know, I think it's just a case of dealer network. It's a very small brand in this country. Yes. In Europe, it's a different story. Um, very small brand. And they, they, they may still struggle. They'll... Finally. Alfa Romeo, the future, the one thing, I mean, it was such a rich history, such a pedigree. There's talk that Alfa Romeo will become the electric vehicle component of the Fiat Stellantis mm -hmm. group. Where do you see it going? I think what's got to look at uh, the world environment at the moment to see where the car manufacturers are going. And it's clear that fossil fuel is, uh, uh, it's, probably going to be unwelcome soon. So it's going to be, it, it, it's going to be inevitable that we're going to see more electric cars. And I think Alfa Romeo seem to be, uh, you, you know, d positioning themselves in that market as a performance electric sort of thing like that. Although the, the Tonale is sort of a hybrid electric. Yeah. So one doesn't know if, if it will be fully electric or, or hybrid going forward. I think if they can do the, um, you know, the synthetic fuel, if that could come online, you may find a lot more hybrid vehicles. And I'm no expert on the modern stuff, but I, I'm just thinking from a, uh, from a pragmatic point of view, it makes more sense to have a, a hybrid effect rather than fully electric. But it seems as though Alfa Romeo have, uh, have placed themselves or positioned themselves in the full electric market. Although, I mean, they keep on bringing out uh, GTA M and uh, more petrol, <laughs> you know, more power, more petrol, but we want to be electric. So, you know, again, confusion. It's a little bit confusion. I think that sums up uh, the wonderfulness and uh, just enigma of uh, Alfa Romeo. Trevor, we could chat for hours. Thank you, my friend. Nice Great to see, to see you. you. Thank you so much. There we go. That's a look at uh, Alfa Romeo. Uh, right here on cars, etc., etc., brought to you by Alt Trader, Altcoin, trader.co.za. Go there, register for free, 
and go and play on the cryptocurrency. Until the next time, take care. Ciao, ciao. Ferris Cars is a Ferrari specialist dealership in Santon, Johannesburg. Since 2010, Ferris Cars has dealt in all things related to Maranello's finest, from classics to the contemporary. Sales, service, advice and exclusive events, Ferris either has it or has access to it. And of course, in partnership with Altcoin Trader, Ferris Cars accepts cryptocurrency and can even help you buy your dream car from any other dealership in crypto. Check out their website at ferriscars.com or follow them on all popular social media platforms.